the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So I'd like, before I begin today, to speak about uh, St. Apollinaris, to add uh, maybe an addendum to yesterday's feast of St. Mary Magdalene. I had wanted to mention, uh, but forgot, uh, what happened to Mary Magdalene, her sister Martha, and their brother Lazarus after the crucifixion. Like, where did they end up? Where did they go? Uh, so uh, tradition uh, tells us that they actually were put into a raft out into the ocean, the Mediterranean, and just shoved off and left to wander and eventually perish. Uh, however, the, the raft was taken to southern France, where they all uh, began to evangelize. Uh, uh, Martha uh, founded an order of nuns, uh, not surprising, her very disciplined, uh, organized nature. Uh, Lazarus became the first bishop of the city of Marseille. If you go back there to the, the, the city of Marseille, the cathedral, you go back to the line of bishops, the, the very first one is Lazarus, uh, the one, very one who was raised from the dead. And St. Mary Magdalene herself uh, lived in a cave where she did penance uh, and lived in austerity and fasting as a hermit, uh, living out the rest of her days. So that was the, um, the ending to yesterday's feast that I meant to add yesterday. You have it now, so uh, there you go. Uh, our saint for today, Saint Apollinaris, uh, is uh, a very early saint. Uh, he was lived in the first century, uh, that is before the year 100, and he's an important part of that link in the chain connecting the Catholic Church of today all the way back to Christ. Uh, for Saint Apollinaris was consecrated Bishop of Ravenna, that is a city nearby Rome. Uh, he was consecrated Bishop by Saint Peter himself. Right, St. Peter, the first pope, consecrated uh, St. Apollinaris, made him Bishop of Ravenna, and, uh, uh, and so that is that connection. Uh, whereas we, uh, we understand that we derive, right, the Catholic Church derives her authority from Christ. And it is from that being able to trace uh, those men who are priests and bishops today, all of them, all of them can trace their spiritual lineage back to Christ through something like this. There's, there are some, there's going to be some bishops today who were consecrated by, uh, uh, eventually, by St. Peter. Some bishops who were consecrated by, uh, you know, St. Apollinaris. That, that's how it works. This is just like the, um, the 12 tribes of Levi. Right, and it, it, you had to be a Jew to be a member of the proper religion. You had to trace your lineage back to one of the, the, the 12 brothers. Uh, that's why Christ chose 12. So it, it went from uh, an Old Testament physical priesthood to a New Testament spiritual priesthood. Uh, the, um, uh, the parallel is clear, and, and this is just a proof that um, we're not making this stuff up. Right? The Catholic Church has historical evidence we know our lineage, we know our heritage, we know where we came from. This is not shrouded in mystery. Uh, we know the men, we know who our first bishop, who the first pope was, who the first bishops were, who the first bishop of Marseille was, who the first bishop of Ravenna was. We, we have all this. So there's, there's, there's ample evidence, ample historical evidence for our faith. So uh, St. Uh, Apollinaris is going to be appointed by St. Peter sometime around the year 60, 64 AD, something like that. Um, preached in Ravenna, and was so successful that he raised the anger of the pagan population, right? Not surprising. Droves of people were converting, and they would leave the pagan temples and start going to, you know, Christian houses to, uh, for worship. And what happened when they left the pagan temples? They took their money with them. And this is what made the pagan priests angry, is they were no longer getting their tithes, they were losing money. And uh, as, as, as the um, gospel for today, or the epistle, is from St. Peter's gospel, and he says, don't minister to people for filthy lucre, but do it willingly, out of love for Christ, love for your fellow brothers. That is what the uh, uh, Catholic bishops were doing. They were ministering to people, not for money, not for gain, just out of love of Christ. And, and, uh, but the pagans, on the other hand, were in it for the money. And when they started to lose money, they started to get upset. And that is a surefire way, actually, to spot a bad shepherd, is when they get upset about money. When that's the number one concern, you know you're dealing with, with a, a bad shepherd, somebody who's in it for the, for the filthy lucre. Uh, so St. Uh, Apollinaris was persecuted for his spiritual success. He was beaten and driven out of town and left for dead. 
Uh, he was found a little while later by faithful Catholics. He was revived, and he returned into the city and resumed preaching. Right? Just to come back doing what he, what he was supposed to do, taking care of his people. Again, uh, he was discovered, he was arrested, and this time he was forced to walk across burning coals while he was barefoot. Uh, probably a pretty painful experience, but he recovered and began preaching once again. So a third time he was arrested. This time he was hacked with knives, scalding water was poured into his wounds, his mouth was bashed with stones, and then he was laden with chains and thrown into a dungeon. All for preaching Christ. Uh, then he was put on a prison ship for Greece. And when he landed, uh, he had learned his lesson, right? Uh, that if you're going to preach for Christ, you've got to be willing to suffer. And he was willing to suffer. So he started preaching again, preaching, teaching, and obtaining converts. And he met with a similar, um, uh, 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 from the Greeks, he met with a similar response. Uh, beatings, imprisonments, and finally, uh, he worked a miracle. He um, went into a, a pagan temple, and the oracles, they had these pagan oracles who were really just possessed persons who would uh, uh, become possessed and speak, you know, whatever the demons would have them speak. This was seen as uh, the mouth of the gods. Well, he would go into a temple, and the oracles would remain silent. They would fall mute in the presence of uh, the man of God. So the Greeks had had enough. They um, put him on a ship and sent him back to Rome. You get him out of here. This is your problem. So a fourth time, uh, we sent him back to Italy. The fourth time he entered the city of Ravenna, where he was properly bishop, and fearlessly began preaching the gospel of Christ again. Uh, the emperor at this time was uh, the emperor Vespasian, who issued an edict of banishment for all uh, Catholics, all Christians. And so Apollinaris, other faithful uh, Catholics with him, uh, went into hiding. And while in the midst of trying to um, uh, either leave the city or, or stay in hiding, uh, St. Apollinaris was discovered and savagely beaten. Uh, in, in some accounts, he was run through with a sword. So he survived for a number of days afterwards, uh, foretelling that although the persecutions would increase, ultimately the church would triumph, which of course she did. And he died on this day, the 23rd of July. Um, it's not known what year, but it would have been sometime around the year 79 AD. Uh, so this is the witness of Christ, right? This is the fulfilling of the gospel mission, is giving one's life to Christ. And it has been said, you know, we wear red today, red for the martyrs who have shed their blood for Christ. Uh, but there's also what is called the, the white martyrdom as well. The white martyrdom is those who have not given their lives for Christ. They haven't been uh, killed. They haven't been martyred. They haven't, you know, had their life taken from them. Uh, but the white martyrdom is laying one's, laying one's life down for Christ day after day. And, and that can be the harder kind of martyrdom. It would be easier in some, some uh, uh, cases just to give one's life once and for all. But to be continually, you know, beaten and uh, persecuted and beaten again and imprisoned and mocked and scourged and released and imprisoned and mocked again and again, over and over again, it would have been easier just to give one's life the first time rather than to live continually with, with pain and with suffering and so on. And especially for some people, um, in, in the Bible, even in the Bible, there are holy men and women who pray for death because life is so painful. Uh, but when we do that, when we are willing to live our life for Christ, no matter what the cost, uh, that can be considered a martyrdom, that the, the church teaches us this. Um, and that there's, a, there's a good prayer uh, that we all should pray and be familiar with, and that is, uh, O oh Lord my God, I now at this moment, ready and willingly, accept at thy hands whatever kind of death it may please thee to send me with all its pains, sufferings, and sorrows. And that is a very good prayer to pray because it helps us to meet death when it comes well. The most important hour of life is the hour of death. And if we've been praying for that, praying for a good death when it comes, uh, hopefully we'll be strengthened and be given the fortitude uh, to have a good death. Uh, so that is a very good prayer to pray. A more difficult prayer to pray, a harder one, all you have to do is change one word in that prayer and it becomes much different. So we pray, O oh Lord my God, I now at this moment readily and willingly accept at thy hands whatever kind of life it may please thee to send me with all its pains, sufferings, and sorrows. That is a harder prayer. 
Because a good death, a, well, I say a, a, a horrible death, a painful death, it may last, what, a matter of hours, even a matter of weeks, a matter of months, right? Some people uh, um, living this painful death. But a painful life, that's 80 years, right? That is a much harder prayer to pray. Uh, but if we pray both of those, right, it won't matter what comes, we will be ready to lay down our life for Christ. Whether that be in a matter of hours or a matter of decades, I've already laid it down for Christ. Whenever he decides to take it, however he decides to use it is up to him. I've already given it away. It's not mine anymore. And there's a very good prayer, the very good attitude to have. And then uh, no matter what happens, we're not distressed. We're not disturbed because God is in control and whatever he wants is up to him, right? We just, we just correspond. Uh, so it encourages us all uh, to pray those prayers and to pray for the intercession of St. Apollinaris, who was not afraid of death or who was not afraid of life either. He uh, was not afraid. He simply preached Christ out of love, love for Christ and love for his fellow man. Let's ask for his intercession to have that same grace as well. God bless you all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.